Hey, good evening, everybody. We're glad that you're with us tonight on this Wednesday night. Thank you for being here tonight, everybody. Sorry I haven't had a chance to meet and greet many of you, but welcome. My name is Sean. Glad to have you. Glad to have you always on Wednesday nights. And we're going to talk a little bit more tonight about heaven. I hope you don't get tired of us talking about that for the next couple of months because we really need to be aware of this and be able to kind of come at it and say, man, you know what? A lot of the things in Scripture I don't know about and some of the things we're just trying to piece together. And I'm not going to give you an answer to everything that we have. I just want to be honest with you because I think I'd be stepping over the bounds of what the Scriptures say about heaven as it presently is and where, pre, uh, where uh, heaven's going to be in the future. I think there's just so many missing holes. Um, I, I really have a hard time. Uh, some that look at the book of Revelation largely and they make all these predictions and, oh, I mean, I can go back and just Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist, you know, all these other, Henry Kissinger is an old Secretary of State in the Carter administration. They felt like they had these numbers correct, and if you added all these numbers up, Henry Kissinger's name was 66, you know, it's all these different stuff like that. It didn't come to be. I remember when our youngest son was getting born in 1989, some man, I just had his name, but I just forgot his name, Joseph Camping, I think was his name, out in California thought Jesus was coming back like in January 15th of 1989. We had just had our boy on the 9th. I'm like, man, I'm going to have a short time with this little boy. That ha Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened, came the 15th. And, th and then all of a sudden, you know, oh, I, I, I miscalculated the numbers. He's going to come back soon. Well, I'm not trying to be smart, but duh, that's the reality of Scripture. Scripture says he's going to come back soon. So, I, th I think when people try to get too, you know, like trying to put a, what do you call those little pins in a map? What is that? What do you call those little push pin? Like, you know, this is when it's going to happen. This is what it's going to be. This is when it's going to happen. This is, it's not that reason. It's not that purpose. All we can say and understand is Jesus is coming and he is faithful and he will be faithful to do what he can and what, what he wants to do. So, Anyway, that being said, I just want to be able to talk tonight about the fact, as I brought up, and we're going to look at uh, Jesus' transfiguration again tonight, just in passing, and we're going to be in the book of Matthew tonight, mostly. Now, we're going to wind up in Acts, which is right next door, so don't freak out too much. The book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, is the first book of the New Testament. And I want to be able to turn there, Tina. I don't know if some of you knew this or not, but I want to share this. Tina was with us on Sunday morning. She sat up, uh, as she should, and uh, she sat up in the balcony and had a covering over her mouth, and we need to be cautious. I know everybody wants to go and just throw their hands around her and give her a hug, but she still needs some space, okay? So, uh, please don't take that in the, ring, in the wrong vein. Uh, I'm just trying to, in, in a way, love her well. And one of those ways that we love her well will be to protect her. And um, so it was great to have you, Tina. Bless your heart. Leanne, always so faithful to see these times. Just great. Everybody check in. Everybody just put your name in the comment section so I can know what's going on and be able to see you. So let's take a look if we can tonight. And let's just talk in a, in, a, in a brief way. I want you guys to be in the book of Matthew. But let's just start off with the first thing that I want to talk about tonight. And that is, many people have this idea. It's almost a, a viewpoint called deism, where God made the world, and then he kind of just went off somewhere. And he is just allowing it to go on. And he has nothing to do with it. It's just kind of like that watch, they call it a watchmaker thing, that he just made this watch. It keeps... And he's, he's way off and he has nothing to do with it. In a way, that's the way we consider heaven. That it is like far away and a totally different way of life and totally almost, you know, like a, a totally different experience. 
And therefore, because we don't, we can't see it, it's called eternal. Many have following Plato, who was roughly a little bit before Jesus' time, uh, kind of have this idea, and Plato kind of really downplayed physical matter. That, that's evil. What really is eternal is this soul that we have. So it's better to let go of the material things and just go to a disembodied time where we can just be souls together. And many in the early church took that whole sense of which heaven is going to be this place where we have no bodies. We're just like floating around or having some type of non-physical existence. Nothing will be further from the truth. Heaven and earth are not far away and far removed. If we could kind of get this idea that heaven interfaces with and interlocks with, and that's what uh, a guy named N.T. Wright kind of says, that it overlaps and interlocks. But I would just say to you that God's space is all around us. Now, it is true that in some thought, Jewish thought that they had a first, second, and third. You know, the first was the air below the clouds. The next was the second heaven was, you know, the space between, you know, uh, beyond the clouds. And then the third heavens was where God existed. But Jesus comes and tells us God is with us. Matter of fact, Jesus' incarnation helps us to understand that God is with us. He's not far removed and far away. He's right here with us. And what happens early in Jesus' ministry? He's baptized, right? And what happens when he comes out of the water? You hear this voice, don't you? And what's the voice say? This is my son. Whom I, I'm not, now, no, nobody had loudspeakers, and this freaky dude over in the corner was saying that. No. God is in our space. He permeated our space and had no problem speaking right through our space. Uh, think about this. Uh, Jesus' first, uh, we can see this in John. Now, we're not going to be in John, but if you want to turn there, what is the second chapter of John? What's Jesus' first miracle? He turns what? He turns water into wine. Now, again, please understand this. These vessels of wine didn't come floating down in some kind of spaceship from a mile away. I mean, but that's kind of, okay, do, 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 all of a sudden, the wine's here. No. It's that like God's space is all around us. He's able to intervene in the physical properties of this world. Why? Because he created it. It's really the same thing that happens with the little boy who comes and gives Jesus his fish and loaves. You didn't have no truck coming down the deal or some dude in a, you know, I don't know if they even had those, you know, like a, a carrier, you know, dude, they have those, over, what are those things called over in Asia where the, the guy, I can't remember what it is. No. Anyway, with Jesus, things just continued to multiply. It was like the bread just continued to be bread. It grew, it grew, it grew. Jesus can do those things because Jesus knew that his heavenly father was right in his midst. What else, what else did he do? Let's just think about his miracles. He brought healing physically to people. You know why? Because he made them. God's not far removed. I don't know how it happened. Now, again, I'm just going to go back and plug this. Um, I just forgot the name. Donna, what's the name of the streaming thing on Angel Studios? The is it chosen? I didn't think it was called the chosen. I had that. Uh, they have some of the miracles that happen. And, you know, it's not like, again, somebody floated through the eyes and gave a, a new leg to somebody because, again, he's far out. No. God is in our midst and is able to communicate between his space, heaven, and our space, earth. Now, anybody just want to talk about another miracle of Jesus that you look at and go, that kind of shows it as well, that God's space, heaven, is all around us. He drove out evil spirits, didn't he? Again, he didn't have to have no science fiction kind of thing or these, you know, uh, and even on, and, um, you know, the, these little pods that are flying through the air. No, he didn't have to do that kind of stuff. Don't, don't think that heaven is way away. Star Wars. 
when did that come out? Like in 1977 or something like that? All I'm trying to say is Jesus' understanding was this. My heavenly Father is right here with me. He's not far away. His space, matter of fact, Jesus came to be the new temple. And the temple was always where who resided? God resided. See, Jesus says, matter of fact, when he comes and gets all the rubble rousers out of the temple, he was making us, he was standing up for the poor people that were being abused by the different ways that all the different sacrifices were being jacked up too high and they couldn't afford them. But he was also doing this. This temple is no longer the place where God meets with his people. Who is? I am now that temple. And what does he say to the religious leaders before he dies? Destroy this temple. And what? I will raise it again in three days. How can you do that, Jesus? See, Herod had started to rebuild the temple, make changes. I mean, it was being built and Jesus comes along and says, you know, this ain't the temple any longer. He's not trying to be disrespectful. He's simply saying that in him, heaven and earth merged. And in knowing him, you know heaven. Heaven is with you. We okay with that? Now, let's go to uh, Matthew real quick. And let's just talk about this just for a second. Tammy, great to have you. Uh, Tina, Patricia, so nice. Blessings on all of you. Let's turn, and because we don't oftentimes think about it this way, but Matthew begins his recording of Jesus' life, and he says, this man came, and it still is. Many philosophers say Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is the highest ethical standing of anything that's ever been written. Now, many people think it's for uh, people that have a dispensational understanding. Um, I don't want to go there, but they still think that this doesn't apply to our world today. This is for a dispensation uh, when Jesus comes in his millennial reign. Again, that's taken from, but this is, this is for the people then. This is not for us now. It's, it's, it's terrible to think that. But Jesus comes on the scene, and he says many different things, and then he talks about prayer, doesn't he? And in Matthew chapter 6, Verses 9 and 10. We could read the whole thing if we want to. I think many of us know this by memory. But he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, way far away, way far away. Doesn't say that, does he? And he actually says, your kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. He's saying you pray because the reality is God's desire is always to make his home here on earth. And Jesus made that possible. What does Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 say? That God will come to dwell among his people. He will be their God and, he, and they will be his people. It is always his concern that heaven and earth merge and be one because his space, his presence is not to be thought of far away and far removed. He wants to come and be with his people. And Jesus says, pray that every day. And I just want to share this. I'm, I'm, I'm the hypocrite here. Maybe you put yourself in that position. I don't think God has taken a stance one iota less than the fact that he could do miraculous things in our midst. I do, however, believe that the church today lacks power to do so because we don't really have a desire that his earth would be invaded and permeated by his presence in our midst. We should pray and pray, oh, Lord Jesus, let your presence overcome us. Let heaven come to earth this Sunday, this night. Jesus, help us. And that's what the early church did. They said, Acts chapter 4, Jesus, considering their threats, you stretch out your hand and you do miraculous things in our midst because they realized that God was far away and maybe somehow he might come in a super jet. No. Jesus, your spirit, your presence is with us right now. Do something for us, Jesus. Amen to that one? Jesus, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
you permeate our space. And I don't, I don't think miracles are something, and there are some secessionists who, who believe that God's miracles stopped in the New Testament. I understand that. I respect that. I just don't agree with it. I just don't see it that way. I, I think God is, and I don't mean to quote this and be like, you know, kind of like arrogant about it. You know, that's just the way that it is. But I, I think God's the same today as he was yesterday as he will be in the future. I, I don't think there's any sense of which, oh, man, what is it now, 2020? Yeah, I'm, I'm done with miracles. That's just, I'm done. Don't believe him anymore, so don't, don't even pray for him. No. I think God wants to do more than what we're willing to say, Lord, you do it for us. Now, let's go to his transfiguration just for a second. I'm not going to read all the way through it, but it starts in Matthew chapter 17. And I just want to uh, just share, you know, do you have any uh, uh, reflections on this? It's called the transfiguration of Jesus. From Sunday's message, do you have anything that you just wanted to make a commentary about or just make a point about or you had a question about it or anything of that nature? Because I, I, I would surely be open um, to hearing from you. But the transfiguration of Jesus is like a foretaste. It's like a, uh, you know, in movies where they kind of now have come out, uh, I'm talking about Star Wars. I think some of their episodes are like prequels, like they, they set the stage for what is to come later. What other kind of movies do that? Any movie buffs here that say this is a prequel? See, a sequel is that which happens after. Okay. Maybe that's okay, no big deal. But this is like a this is like a, a a a prequel. This is a sign of what is to come. And we see, and I don't want to go back all over this. He takes his three to a mountain, and Moses, who gave the law, and Elijah, who was the great prophet, come with Jesus, transfigured, and Jesus is transfigured in their own mind. Again, see, this is really wacky if you think God is far away and far removed and somehow comes and does, like in some kind of, I don't know what, comes and does it? No. The early church realized that God was in their midst. And Jesus shows them a foretaste of what his glorified body was like. And what happens here? What voice do we hear? Does someone want to read it? Verse 5. Tiffany, I'm not going to read the first verses. Can you get to verse 5 maybe? I don't know if you can or not. Uh, While he was still speaking, that's Jesus, a bright cloud covered them. Where was there a cloud before? God led the people by a cloud in the Old Testament, didn't he? God oftentimes speaks through clouds. That was a symbol of his presence in the Old Testament. But again, see, they didn't go and like, what kind of wacky thing is this? This is God's world. This is my Father's world, right? And I'm not trying to say we go around looking at tulips and Lord speak. I'm not trying to, don't get wacky that way. I'm just trying to say that they had no, no problems with saying this is, this is his world. And this voice comes and says, this is my son whom I love, whom, with whom I am well pleased. He's carrying that forward and he says, listen to him. Now, those three words are what discipleship is all about right there. That's what discipleship is. I want to listen and obey Jesus because God the Father said, you want to be a wise person, you listen to Jesus. And Jesus can help us and speak to us. He doesn't have to go through a cloud. He can speak to us individually because why? And we're going to get there in just a second. We have his spirit within him. We okay with that? You see how, I'm not not trying to be redundant, but you see how God has always wanted us to know he's present with us. He is always wanting us to know his space. The intention of his space is always to be with us. And Paul says, the Holy Spirit is a what? A deposit of that which is coming. He has given us his presence near and dear because that's exactly what's going to happen in heaven one day. The presence of God and the person of Jesus is going to be in our midst. Now, 
people ask, well, Sean, how can that be? Hold on, there's got to be millions of Christians. I don't know all those ins and outs. All I'm telling you is we will know the presence of Jesus. We'll be, go, we'll be going about our day, creating and loving and doing all kinds of things. But you know how kids, can you go back when you were a young kid? When your parents were around, you knew it, and there was a sense of comfort for you to live your life. You understand? I mean, <laughs> some of you go like, that was many days ago, Sean. But can you remember that? As long as I could see where my parents were, I'm cool. You want to know one of the boneheaded things that we ever did? My wife used to work for Delta Airlines, and we, f- we didn't fly all the time. That's just kind of one of those myths. Man, if I worked for an airline, I'd be flying every day. No, you can't. You still get taxed on, although you don't get charged, they call it non-revving, which means you don't pay the fare, but you have to pay the taxes on top of it, and that adds up too. We had our third child, Chad, and um, I don't even care where it was. It doesn't make any difference. We were in an airport, and that boy was playing on his uh, little computer game, had earphones on, and my wife and I and two older boys proceeded to get on the plane. Little did we know that our youngest, Chad, was so engrossed in his game, he never got up. And they closed the door on the plane, and we're looking, going, like, where is Chad? Yeah, we, that, was, that was model parenting right there, just to let you know that. So thankfully, they knew we were, you know, Delta. My wife was a Delta employee, and they opened the door, and we were able to get Chatty. He came running onto the plane, like, big old eyes like that. Like, I thought, oh, what are you doing? You're going to leave. <laughs> I don't know where we were. There was a movie, uh, Home Alone, right? Home Alone 1, 2, 3, something like that. That's basically the same kind of a deal. But Exactly, yes. Now, it's, that, that really happened. And, uh, yeah, yeah. This has nothing to do with the message tonight, but I, I'm, I'm having confession with you on boneheaded things I've done. I locked my car keys in a gas station in the middle of winter in Kansas City. And the kids were asleep in the back of the van that we had. And I ran into the store. Can you imagine doing that today? Now, I'm not trying to say I I was completely irresponsible. But it was cold. I didn't want to get the kids out. I just had to go in and get milk. My kids drank so much milk. The church was across the street from me. You guys, they're getting more and more popular, but out in the Midwest, Quick Trip is like everywhere. You know, the gas station convenience store called Quick Trip? There was one across the highway from where our church was, and my wife was like, Sean, we need more. So I would literally go in, and as big as my hands could be, I'm grabbing like two or three gallons, two or three here, paying for them walking out. We need we need milk. And I, it's freezing. Okay, I'll do it. So I went over, and sure enough, little did I know that my keys had dropped out, and I had clicked the lock button, and I shut the door. And you know what I did? I went out and started to rock the van to see if they would wake up. I couldn't do it. So here I am sitting there going like, you know, boy, isn't this a great thing to have to describe to somebody? Uh, yeah, me, yes, I did. I locked my, yes, I locked my keys, yes. Locked my kids in the car too, yep. I'm a bonehead. So I had to call a cop, and they used one of the Jimmy sticks to come out. But, oh, I, I think most of us could look back and go, if we were to have received the just consequence of some of the things we've done in our life. Where, does anybody else, do, are, you, are, are you guys like, Sean, you just, you've just shown me a level of parenting. I've never thought anybody, okay, if that's you, That's fine, but I have a feeling all all of us could probably do something and go, you know what, I've done some boneheaded things myself. I I just, yeah, but I have. Yeah, but that's what, one of the biggest ones was we almost left our kid in the airport somewhere and flew home somewhere, and yeah, he was a little dude at the time, so yeah, that's kind of one of those things. All I'm trying to say is this, is that when you think about life, don't let yourself think about heaven being somewhere far away that you're going to have to be transported in some kind of light saber or 
shuttle that's going to take you off somewhere. Heaven is all around us. And this experience with Jesus' transfiguration wants us to understand that at any time, Jesus could have shared with us heaven's space as well as him living on this earth. What happens when John looks back? John is the fourth gospel. And he said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled, actually templed with us. That's what John, he's, he's just going right back to the very beginning. He's saying Jesus is a new temple. Jesus is now where God's glory reigns. But what's he say? Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his what? His glory. The glory of the one and only Father who came from his side. You see, the New Testament realized in Jesus. It took them time. It took them time. But they came after his resurrection to see Jesus was God in the flesh. And his glory is still with us. And he is with us now. Look at Matthew chapter 27. We're not going to talk about this because this, well, we could talk about it any time. But this is Jesus' death. And I just want us to just look at this uh, from Matthew's perspective. Um, from noon until 3, this is Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. Look at the way God brings mastery through Jesus to the, to the world itself, to the known world, to creation, to present day. This is 2,000 years ago, but on the day that Jesus was crucified, look what happens. From noon until 3 in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. Ah, oh, that is so silly. God couldn't do that. If he's far away, he, he wouldn't. But God was in and through his son, and his presence was there on Golgotha. He wasn't far away. All of creation groaned when Jesus was put to death. It became dark. He cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic, which Jesus spoke. And that means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He goes through, they put vinegar up to him. And verse 50, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at the moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, we can go into all this, but look at these supernatural things, if you will, that are happening. But I don't want you to think about supernatural like being something so unique and so one of a kind. No. The early church realized that miracles were the result of an ever-present God, not the one-time intrusion of a God that's far away that does something miraculously one time and then who knows when he's going to appear again. The temple was the curtain. See, the veil. The veil of the temple was torn between the two. That's really what heaven is all about. Let me, let me share this with you, and I think it's good. Uh, we oftentimes, and it's okay to talk about Jesus' second coming, that gives off the indication that he's coming like in a spaceship. The reality is, I think it's far better to say Jesus reappearing because he will reappear. It's not going to be like some kind of, he's just going to, sh why? Because God's space is right in front of us and all around us. He will reappear again. But look at all this stuff. Temple was torn into, or the curtain in the temple. The earth shook. Rock split, and the tombs broke open. Now, this is kind of one of those things that many people don't know what to deal with, but I think it just is proof of the fact that God was present the day Jesus died, and he began to even show signs then that resurrection and new life was coming. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him, see, we oftentimes just think it was a centurion. There are others that were guarding Jesus. When they saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, yeah, 
<laughs> That's a t- uh, yeah. Surely this man was the son of God. Because he showed God's space and he showed God's power right in our power, right in our place. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Now, one last thing I want to talk about before we get out of here, that heaven and earth aren't far away. They're really interlocked. They are on top of each other. God's space is right here with us. You understand what I'm trying to say there? It literally, I don't know how to say it. Give me another way. It overlays our space. You understand what I'm trying to get to? It's right around us. God is in our midst. Jesus and his spirit are within us and will help us. And God's space, and I just want to share this again before we get out of here. That's the reason why, and I don't want to get into a kind of heavy, maybe morbid thought tonight, but that's the reason why many Christians, when they are passing from this world into the next, begin to see visions of what life is going to be like. They have, they're like one foot in our space, and yet they're beginning to, why? Because that veil between this life and the life to come is so short. And Dallas Willard used to say, Sean, I really believe some people are going to be living in heaven before they are able to understand they passed away on earth. Because it's such a natural progression that, you know what? I am now in the presence of Jesus. Because we oftentimes think about, I got to get in some kind of spaceship when I breathe my last breath. And I don't know when I'm going to, you know, no. The last breath that we take in this body will be the first breath and the first eyelid of seeing Jesus face to face. And uh, we're going to talk about that coming up in times to come. But when and we're going to talk about this when, when people die. The, the most important thing that we can find about heaven right now is that description. You are in the presence and peace and joy of Jesus. There's not a lot more that can be said about this. When God comes to make all things new and gives us a new body, that comes in the future. But right now, you can know if you have a loved one, they are in the presence and peace and joy of Jesus. And Jesus makes everything. Heaven is not heaven if Jesus isn't there. I don't care what else you I'm just going to enjoy the streets of gold. Well, okay, if you understand that the biggest joy of heaven is Jesus and all that Jesus is going to do in your life in the eons and millennia to come. If that's what you want, you go there now. Trust him now and he'll help you right on through when you pass and you go into eternity. But look at this real quick, and then we're going to be done. Turn to Acts. So we're in the first book of the New Testament. Turn to Acts real quick. That's the fifth book of the New Testament. That kind of details. Luke, who was a doctor, wrote the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, that's a gospel, talking about the life of Jesus. And then Luke also recorded what the early church did in response to who Jesus was. That's what they call Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles. So that's the fifth book of the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. And again, this 2,000 years ago, people thought this was stupid, thought that people were idiotic. They thought that, you know, these people were drunk, that these people were having some kind of psychologic or psychedelic experience. What are you guys smoking? You know, they had no clue. That's the way people are going to be. That's okay. And I'm not trying to say it in a rude way, but we as Christians should say, whatever people think, I know Jesus is right here, and I know his space is right here with me, and I know that he's where I'm going to rely upon it. You okay with that? So the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, which was a prime Jewish holiday, people from all around the known world would come. And Luke says, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, the blowing of a violent wind. See, it just happened. It didn't come like from like, what is that way up in the sky? Oh, what? You know, no, it just happened right in their midst. A violent wind came from heaven. Where's heaven? Right around them. Isn't it amazing sometimes? um, You could have a perfectly calm day. Let's go to to summertime. And it's now stoking. 
early in the summer, you know, temperatures are like, you know, 85, 86, 87. But now we're in the, 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 the heat of August. And they get on, hey, listen, we may have thunder showers, thunderstorms. Why? The very hot meets with the cold front that's coming through. Heat rises. Cold air sinks. Isn't it amazing how you can have a perfectly calm day? But about 4.30 when everything's heating up and the air becomes very unstable and the wind just naturally and it, you, you can almost, can you hear it? It comes whistling through the, it's like, whoa. Friend, if God can do that in our creator order, there's no reason he can't do the same thing with his spirit. And the people are just waiting there, and all of a sudden, they were able to sense the Lord's presence through this. And what? The whole house where they were seating, they saw tongues of fire separating, coming to rest on, they all, verse four, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the languages of the people that had come from all around the Roman Empire to come and celebrate that Jewish feast. See, that, that's a picture of a God who's ever-present with us. That's a picture of a God who reaches right out from the space around us and does miraculous things. And it goes on. How much do I have here? Yeah, let's keep reading. Verse 5, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. <laughs> Say, there we go. When they heard this, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears in our own native tongue? You get what's happening here? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, I'm not going to go, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius. These are all areas of the world. And you see, God is able to do miraculous things, but it is through what? His presence. And I just want you to keep that in mind today as we leave this place. Pentecost is about the fact that God brings the spirit of his son into this world and even deeper than that, when you're willing to open up your life to him, he comes and resides within you. That's how close the God of heaven is with you. His space is all around you. So what happens? They begin to have, uh, they go out and begin to share, hey, Jesus is alive. Oftentimes is the case. People don't like to hear there's another king that's come. So they start throwing him in jail. What do they do at midnight? Are they down on their luck? They're singing praises to the real king. And guess what happens? Chains break, doors walk open. So, and I'm not trying to be silly here. I don't, but that seems so foreign because we have so relegated God to being far away. And yet the early church knew, you know what? I don't care if I'm in a prison. I don't care if I'm sick. I don't care. What's he say? Peter and John, I don't have anything. I don't have silver or gold to give to you, sir, but I do know this. Jesus is living, and I'm going to give you Jesus. And the power of Jesus brought healing to that man. Heaven and earth, friend, aren't far away. We've relegated it that way, and we're not able to say, Jesus, I know you're right here with us. And that's at the heart of worship. If every time we came together, we said to ourselves, I see one of these walls, gray, bluish gray, and I see gray carpeting, and I see pianos and keyboards. Yes, that's, but bigger than that, I see Jesus in our midst. Jesus is with us, and I'm going to, and we're going to come and say, Jesus, you show yourself to us. You make heaven on earth, and we start to be that kind of a church. Shackles are going to come off people. Prison doors are going to open up. The little that we think we have, two fish and what is it, five loaves, are going to be expanded so that we're going to look and go, what in the world is going on in this church? I'm going to tell you what's going on. When we expect for Jesus to come and do what he can do in our space, which he wants to do, the little that we have will feed 5,000 people. Amen to that one? Miracles will happen. Because Jesus isn't far away. Jesus is still 
right in our midst. And he's heaven. He's heaven. Amen to that? Okay. Lord Jesus, we want that. We want that. Take the blinders off our eyes. Give us a renewal, a refreshing of your spirit within us. Let us, when we gather together, say, Jesus, come and be with your people. We need it. As the song says, you are the air we breathe. We're desperate for you, Jesus. You are heaven. And one day we'll be in your presence. And then one day later, you will give us new bodies and a new heaven and a new earth. But right now, would you help us to experience heaven in our midst? Do miraculous things, Lord Jesus, for us. Multiply our fish and bread. Open prison doors. Cut off shackled feet and shackled minds and shackled people. Set people free. And may together we experience your presence, Jesus, in our midst. We long for that, Jesus. We want it more and more. And we give you praise tonight. And we pray what you told us to pray. You are our heavenly Father, and we want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. For you deserve all the glory and the praise and the honor forever and ever. Amen. We love you, Jesus. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. Well, everybody, thank you so much. And I just want to share with you, I guess we have one big announcement. By the way, I saw, um, uh, and, and, yeah, it's just the person she is. Sharon Stout is in really in need of our prayers. Um, she's not getting, she's, she has so much congestion in her lungs, which uh, her respiratory issues have been an issue uh, ever since she's had a heart transplant. And uh, we need to pray for Sharon. I saw them today, and one of the first things she said is, Sean, that baptismal service at the end just did something for me, how precious it was. She was watching even though she was so sick in the hospital. So we need to be praying for her that in the coming days she can get to a rehab facility and they can help her get up and start using her body. And So we need to be praying. Anybody else, Tina, God bless you. God, God bless you. Yeah. Danny Tidmore, Angela Moore, somebody newer to our church, Jason and Angela, has a, a brother that has cancer, and brain cancer, I think it is, and these are prayers. Anybody else tonight before we get out here, just mention people that we just, oh, Lord, be with them. Anybody else? It may be you. I, I mean, I'm not saying it can't be you, but any, anything, anybody at home, if you just want to let us know. Yeah, David. What's, yeah, David, yeah. I, I knew who you were talking about. Yeah, David is dealing with some tests, and he's, I ha, has he gotten any results back? I haven't, yeah. Good. Well, we pray, Jesus, your blessing upon any person that has need in our church. We intercede for them. We intercede for anybody who's watching us tonight or who will watch this. Jesus, bring yourself to bear on these issues of our life. Bring healing to us, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Now listen, as we get out of here, things are a little different this weekend, and I just want to share them. Hey, Stacy, I feel like I might need a little help. So if, if I do anything that kind of comes across double switching or is contradictory, or you may say, Sean, that's not what we're going to do, you just chime in and you just set me straight. Um. We're not going to have, this coming Sunday is Appreciation Sunday. And we're getting ready to go into the Thanksgiving season. You're saying, Sean, what is appreciation? It's appreciating the people of our church. And I would like for you to invite anybody that you know has been, is, or will be a part of our church to come. 
we're going to have a service outside, and uh, we're going to enjoy a time of looking at God's Word through that. Now, listen, if you're watching online, uh, we will have a service for you at our normal time at 1030 a.m. Central Time. So you just be aware of that. Now, I, do, I don't want you to think, oh, man, uh, we just we don't have the ability to go outside to our, it's a, it's a beautiful pavilion, but it's a little bit of distance from the church, and we, you know, just, we, we can't do it. There's no, we don't have portable uh, you know, cameras and everything else like that and our audio, so we just can't do it live. But we will have a service for anybody that's on our social media platforms, our church app. Faith Community Church, I'm sorry, Faith Community Church TN, which is the abbreviation for Tennessee. Faith Community Church TN. Or you can watch us on Facebook if you want to do that. So any way that you will, you say, oh, man, no, we're going to have, and I think you're going to really enjoy the service. So don't cut out. Don't think like we're leaving you on the lurch. We're trying to take care of you, and we will have a service for you at 1030 Central Time. Stacy is going to be the genius behind all that. So don't think that we won't have anything. You just be here and be a part of our worship service. Now, for us that will be here in person, bring your lawn chairs. Bring your tents. If it looks like now, it could change. Does anybody have a revised forecast? It looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. I was going to say, it's like 60 in the morning, goes up to mid-80s in the afternoon, and maybe even more than that. So bring your tents. Bring your whatever lawn chairs. Bring some food. If you can't bring food, don't worry. Hey, listen, dude. You need to be cooking up your desserts. I'm just telling you. You're not going to be here? Oh, my word, Marvin. Ah, oh, I'm just kidding you, man. But when he shows up a lot of times, I mean, he brings some major desserts. Whoosh. Anyway, see, we're going to have to supplement what Marvin can't do. So you guys got to stand in the gap. Just bring what you would bring for yourself and maybe for one or two or three other people. So if you're making something, make it a little bit bigger if you can. If you can't, don't worry about it. And if you're in our community and you're saying, man, you know, it'll be enough for me just to show up, just show up. Don't bring anything. The food will be on us, okay? So if we're here and you bring something and we'll have enough food, just come. We'd be love, it. love to have you be a part of this. It'll be from 1030. It's not going to be an hour-long service. We'll get done some probably you know, about 11, 15, somewhere in that range. And then we're going to have a potluck dinner outside. And uh, Terry has already put together some games for kids. And we'll, you can bring, if you want to bring something, as long as we're willing to get away from other people, if you want to bring a, a baseball or a Frisbee or something else like that, basketball, go, whatever you want to do, we'll be there. So 1030 this coming Sunday morning, bring a little bit of food. It's going to be a good day. And I want to celebrate this church. I think sometimes we, I don't know how to say it. We are thankful, but we just don't get around to thanking the people that have been a part of our church and remembering the people that have made this church what it is, okay? And we want to do that. Now, I'm not going to pull somebody out and say, you know, how long have you been here? Oh, that makes you, you know, you're old now. No, I'm not going to do that. But we're just going to celebrate. The, aren't you thankful for the faithful people of this church through the century, I said through the centuries, through the years. Been in existence about 50 years. I've only been a part of it four. But I know, many of you know people that have either passed on or that are now shut in or that can't be here for other reasons. I just want to appreciate them and celebrate you as well. So that'll be this coming Sunday morning. And if you can help in any way setting up, uh, Walter, what time will be helpful? 8 o'clock? We always use 8 o'clock. I don't know why 8 o'clock is the deal. But we're going to set up. To... Okay. If you can help in any way setting up, be here about 8.30, anywhere between 8.30 and 9 o'clock because we've got a lot of chairs to set up. We've got to put up tables. We've got to do you know, just some basic things to get ready for the weekend. So uh, it's going to be a good day. So if you can help out, 8.30, 9 o'clock, be here. And uh, we'll get some things done, and we look forward to having a great day. I love you all. Whatever's going on in your life, Jesus is not far removed. He is, he is in your breath. He is in your bones. He is right there with you.
And friend, I don't care how far you think you may be away from God, how far away you think you've run and you can't get back home, I'm going to tell you this. I don't care how many steps, how many miles, how many countries you've gone, Jesus is but a step away. If you are just willing to turn around and say, Jesus, I need you, he will be on your next breath. Amen to that? Mm -hmm.